Okay. So first of all, welcome to everyone. And I, before we really start, I want to share something here that, um, oh, wait a second, I lost my word. Okay, um, something that um, Muggsy asked me to share with you, which is, he also wrote it on the chat. Um, he's asking me to announce that the IUAES Commission on Marginalization and Global Apartheid is holding a webinar on the 3rd of June at 4, at, well, at 2 p.m. UTC on the topic, Globalization as Analytical, as an Analytical and Political Concept. So the announcement is made and um, it's on, like I said, it's on the chat also, you can check it. So, um, so once again, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Clara Saraiva. I'm, I'm the president of the Portuguese Anthropological Association and I'm also a member of the, a designated member of the WCAA organizing committee. And so first of all, I want to thank everyone for being here and welcome everyone. Um, and we know that in some places it's 5 a.m. or 5.30, in others it's pretty late. So thank you so much for, for this effort. Uh, this webinar is our ninth WCA webinar. Um, as you know, uh, WCA has been uh, holding, organizing and holding this webinar since April 2020 when the pandemic spread. Um, and as you know, WCA is part of WOW, the World Anthropological Union, together with IUAES, uh, the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. Uh, I also want to tell you, although Michelle did it already, that this webinar is being recorded and it will be later on available on our WCA WOW site. So it will be available online. When you insert comments or questions in the chat, please give us your name and country so that we have an idea at the end which countries participated. I want to make a few special um, thank yous to the organizing committee of WCA and especially to Virginia Dominguez, who's always been um, a colleague helping a lot in organizing this webinar, suggesting colleagues to participate, etc. And I, of course, also want to thank Michelle Bouchard from the University of Northern British Columbia, who is the host, the official host of this Zoom meeting and who biked to be at the university at 5.30 a.m. And also Ricardo Faguaga, uh, also a colleague from the WCA, from the WCA um, organizing committee, who's in charge of communication and who basically took care of spreading the news about this webinar. So today, the topic of this webinar, our ninth webinar, as I said, is um, North-South Relations in Anthropology. We will have um, quite a range of participants. We will have Karim Friedman from the National Donghua University in Taiwan. We'll have Moenda Natarangui from Nairobi, Kenya. Francine Sayan from Laval University in Quebec, Canada. Carmen Rial from the Universidade Federal Santa Catarina. Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. A very quick introduction. Uh, the introduction will be really quick. We normally have this webinars last for one and a half hour, well, you know, 15 minutes more tops, but not longer than that. So one hour 30, one hour 45 minutes tops. And this particular webinar uh, is based on uh, some reflections that were brought up in a motion organized and written by the, uh, well, by ABBA, but in, and especially brought out and br put together and brought out in the 31st uh, meeting of our RBA, which is the, the annual um, meeting of the Brazilian Anthropological Association. The, propose, the proponents of this motion were uh, Gustavo Rines Ribeiro from the University of Brasilia and Carmen Real from the University, uh, uh, the Federal University of Santa Catarina, who will also be a, a speaker today. And basically this motion uh, is directed at graduate programs in anthropology and anthropological associations worldwide. And it's been endorsed by the Werner Grant Foundation. Just very short, in a sh summarize what this motion is about so that you can understand 
what is our starting point for the discussion. This motion basically considers the unequal, unequal academic exchanges within the global academic system and in an effort to establish international exchanges that are more horizontal, fair, fair and solidary, calls for identities, agencies and agents involved in the pluralization of international anthropological knowledge to implement several measures. First, to avoid cognitive extractivism. So to only finance research projects to be conducted abroad that clearly demonstrate knowledge of work produced by local academics and instruct foreign researcher, researchers to consider local academics as partners and not as informants and to cite them properly, of course. And the second thing, the second aim or second goal is to increase the diversity of knowledge. The idea that journals should publish articles by anthropologists from a variety of countries and to pluralize the composition of editorial boards and their policies, considering the diversity of international perspectives. So it's with this in our minds that we will have our speakers uh, whom I will present now. We will have first Karim Friedman, who's a professor in the Department of Ethnic Relations and Cultures at National Donghua University in Taiwan. His research explores language revitalization efforts among indigenous Taiwanese, Taiwanese looking at the relationship between language ideology, indigeneity, and political economy. He's also an ethnographic filmmaker, and he made the Jean Rouge Award winning the commentary about a street um, theater troupe from one of India's denotified and nomadic tribes. He's also co-founder of the anthropology, anthropology blog, Dandum, formerly named Savage Minds. The second speaker, as we will go from, from east to west, is uh, Mwenda Natarangui, who is the CEO and Commission Secretary of the Commission for University Education in Kenya. He has taught anthropology and other courses for two decades and carried out administrative work in different capacities in Kenya and in the US. He works on the intersection of performance and identity in popular culture, and um, he also works on anthropology as a discipline. The third speaker will be Francine Sayan, who's a professor emeritus at the Department of Anthropology at Laval University, Quebec. And uh, she's an outgoing director of CELAT, Center for Research on Arts, Cultures and Societies. She's a, she's a specialist in anthropology of human rights, and she conducts research on discrimination based on the idea of race and on various forms of discrimination, the various uses and interpretations of no notions of justice and rights and the social life of rights. She also collaborates with various civil society organizations in connection with questions of intercultural dialogue and of recognition. The fourth speaker is our just a former uh, WCA chair, Carmen Rial, who I think is known to all of us. She's an anthropologist and journalist, professor at the Federal University of Santa Catarina and the researcher of CNPq, the National Council of Scientific and Technological Development in Brazil. She directs the Center for Visual Anthropology and is a member of the Institute of Gender Studies. Rial is a former president of the Brazilian Anthropological Association and of the World Council of Anthropological Associations. Her work focuses on, global, on globalization, cultural globalization, transnational migration, gender, consumption, consumption and sport. Finally, last but not least, Danielin Rutherford Ford is president of the Wayne Grand Foundation for Anthropological Research. Earlier, she was associate professor of anthropology at the University of Chicago and chair of anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her research has focused on the disputed Indonesian half of New Guinea. Of New Guinea. She is currently completing an ethnographic memoir on disability, belonging, and communication in the United States. So having presented the theme and having presented our participants, I will give the floor to the first one. So as I said, we will start from east to west. So I will give the word first to our colleague from Taiwan, Karim Friedman. Uh, uh, yes, Karim Friedman, sorry. I, I wasn't sure yes. I was saying your name right, but no, I was. that's fine, that's fine. Okay, great, thank, thank you very you. much. And thank you very much once again. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to 
take part in this event. I was kind of hoping I would go last instead of first, since I haven't really been part of this discussion earlier. And I've just, you know, I'm just going entirely based on the statement that we were given uh, from the colleagues in Brazil, which I thought was a very interesting statement, but is also quite um, out of the sphere in some ways uh, from Taiwan. And so I want to talk a little bit about that based on my my research and my experiences, how these issues strike me. And I really just kind of have four, hopefully brief interventions or questions that will hopefully spark more dialogue. Uh, so the first one comes from my uh, work as a linguistic anthropologist. And it seems to me that one thing I noticed missing from this statement was the question of language. And so, uh, you know, the question of translation seems very, very important for me for trying you know, to, to maneuver and establish links between countries in North and South. Uh, I, you know, do we have uh, money for translating you know, more works? Do we have uh, editors and proofreaders to help non-native speakers who are publishing in other languages? How are journals, I've seen my Taiwanese colleagues get very frustrated when they submit an article and just get a comment back saying, uh, get a native speaker to proofread this, you know, without really engaging with any of the ideas in the article. Uh, so, you know, and then in the other side, you know, here in Taiwan and elsewhere, there's so much pressure to publish in English, you know, and, uh, you know, what does that do? Uh, and then also, uh, you know, the, the uh, citation practices, you know, and the importance of, you know, English sources versus non-English sources uh, in terms of, you know, it's often quite okay to use uh, non-English sources as data, but how about for theory? We very rarely see theorists cited in other languages, you know, outside of the, you know, the big, uh, you know, Foucault and Bourdieu and so on. So that gets me to uh, my second intervention, which is uh, internal colonialism and North-South relations within countries. I work at a college of indigenous studies in Taiwan, and we talk a lot about how to try and get indigenous voices and indigenous ideas incorporated into the Chinese speaking sphere within Taiwan, uh, not to mention globally. And you know, I've also done work in India where Adivasi uh, ideas and concepts are often quite marginalized by scholars who you know, do work, uh, you know, go to Cambridge and Oxford and Harvard and you know, work in a global sphere, but don't really interact with uh, people within their, you know, India's own marginal communities, unless they are specifically doing research on those communities. So, you know, and then these are communities whose often don't have large written traditions, but they often have uh, oral traditions and other forms of knowledge that are often devalued because they're not, you know, published again by, you know, in certain venues. Um, a third issue I wanted to raise and hopefully sort of create some dialogue about is the question of safety and freedom uh, to publish and talk about issues or even movement and travel uh, within, you know, within these various spheres. You know, there, I notice, for instance, uh, scholars who work in certain areas, for instance, in China, who have to be very careful and self-censor themselves in order to maintain access to regions and people that they want to work with? And how do we deal with, how do we support uh, those scholars? Uh, how do we address their silences? Uh, you know, and uh, also, um, uh, you, know, you know, how do we support scholars like Uyghur anthropologist, Rahel Dawood, who has been missing since 2017, presumably in a re-education camp. And uh, so then uh, my fourth uh, and you know, last intervention sort of has to do with the position of Taiwan in this debate is, you know, Taiwan is now one of the 25 wealthiest nations in the world. It's not a South country. And yet it's kind of marginal in a way because it's not, in, you know, a lot of work is not done in English. It's done in Chinese. And then it's also in the shadow of China and Japan, and you know, that's changed a lot 
in the past year, I have to say, like with COVID, suddenly Taiwan's in the news all the time. And, you know, because of Taiwan's strong response to COVID, there are a lot of scholars and newspaper writers and other people here. But at the same time, though, I think that, uh, you know, historically, as long as I've been here, I've seen, you know, often Taiwan perspectives quite marginalized uh, in, in discussions about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, North and South or about uh, uh, East and West. And part of that has to do with Taiwan's own reluctance to take a leadership role. Taiwan often, uh, Taiwanese I speak to often think of themselves, uh, often think of themselves as kind of a developing nation still, even though that's no longer the case. And I think because of that, Taiwanese often look to Canada and Europe and uh, Australia, New Zealand, and don't themselves go and take a leadership role in the Philippines, in India, uh, and in other places. When I attend indigenous conferences, we're always inviting indigenous speakers from many of these other North, plate, North countries and not, you know, not so much having dialogue with some of the uh, places that are less developed. So I think Taiwan itself could uh, try and start thinking of itself as part of the North which is uh, an interesting thing to start doing. Anyway, those are my four questions and interventions, and I look forward to hearing how other people uh, react to those or respond to those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karim. Um, we will now pass the word to Moenda Natarangui from uh, Kenya. Thank you, thank you again. Uh, uh, I also want to thank you all for inviting me to this. Uh, my daily job does not give me the privilege of discussing ideas in anthropology. I probably practice them more than I theorize about them. And I just wanted to start by saying that um, relationships are good when they're done well, uh, because through relationships, we exchange ideas, we learn, we expand our territories, we, we do better networks. Uh, but we have to understand that uh, before even relationships take place, they, we are entering into already existing narratives, uh, certain assumptions, certain things that we have about the place or the people or the community that we are getting uh, into. So as much as we as practitioners want to deal with them, we have to understand that we are entering into narratives. Sometimes narratives about uh, superiority, sometimes narratives about inferiority, uh, sometimes narratives about uh, rich uh, resources, no resources, uh, as, as, as uh, Karim has mentioned, sometimes language deficiencies. And so we enter into already existing narratives and we try to either fit into them, navigate through them, uh, depending on what we do. So the question then we, I, I, I felt I should ask is, uh, when the initial encounter, initial contact, initial communication takes place, um, what is the intent? And how do we make those uh, connections? How are we contacted? Sometimes we are contacted or we contact the people that we want to work with because uh, I know for, in case of Kenya that uh, you need to have a research permit. Sometimes you need to have an affiliation with an institution that is carrying out research. And so you come in needing some leverage into working at an institution uh, to carry out your research. And so that already gives you a certain level of how you interact uh, with the local. It is very transactional. Uh, you know, it's, I need, to, I need to get into the field. I need a, a, field, I need a research permit. And uh, you are the one who can help me do this and tell me what do I need to do so that I can get there. So those can be, can be transactional. Others are uh, out of uh, friendships that have been formed elsewhere. And then you happen to uh, have an interest because of the relationships you built. So you decide, I have an opportunity to look at uh, this topic. And my friend, uh, Michelle is in Quebec and I want to go to Quebec. And so I contact him and we start looking at what are some of the best ways to do this. That, that, that becomes much more of a collaborative uh, a process. 
there are scenarios again that uh, we, we tend to see when, when there are relationships between North and South. This that collaboration I talk about, there is the assistance uh, to uh, sort of get into the field. There is the partnership where we are working to produce something together, maybe publish together. But in either of them, I would say that uh, we have to ask who defines the direction of the relationship? Who determines the priority areas of focus and the expected outcomes? And are we as collaborators, as partners, as relate, people who are relating aligned in terms of our professional interests, our level of engagement, our ability to change the direction of the work. Then we have to ask ourselves, what value do we assign each part of that process? Is my access to the local language as valuable as your access to the resources, the money that allows us to do this work? How do we value those? Because again, those tend to shape the relationship. And do we value the funds more? Do we value the translation more? Do we value the or transcribing? Do we value the interviews, the observations? What about the interpretations or reinterpretations, etc.? And how do ideas and theories, I think as uh, Kareen has said, developed outside of the North, shaping the way we think about humans, the way we enter into academic discourses, the way we think about ourselves as scholars, as anthropologists, how our practices. And one of the things that I did when I, when I wrote my book, Reverse Gaze, was to ask how much of the field experience actually shapes our lives outside of the field as anthropologists. If truly we believe that uh, the cultural uh, relations are part of what shapes us and we have two, three years in another context, how are those shaping who we are becoming as humans, as professionals, as practitioners? And I would, I would say that um, it really has to take a lot of self-awareness a lot of work that is done in thinking and asking for honest opinions from the other people that you're working with. And I wanted to say, what should we do in instances where we are getting into this uh, potentially imbalanced in terms of power relations? I would say the first thing is to do the thing that we are supposed to do as anthropologists, reflexive reflexivity all the time. Who am I? What is my position? How is it? How does it affect what I do? What's the already existing story? What's existing narrative between the relationship that we are going to form if it is something that uh, we haven't already addressed? And how do we deal with that? Then the other thing is, how do we co-create ideas about whatever work we are doing, whether it's a a, a publication, whether it's research, whether it's a conference, how do we co-create ideas so that the priorities that are in the North are also aligned with the priorities that are in the South? I mean, if you were to do something about um, cross-border issues that are affecting everyone, why should one's ideas be more strong, be stronger than the, the other person when they're all being affected uh, by the same uh, thing? Then how do we co-create the research questions? How do we decide what chapters will be in the book and how will they be written and who takes what? And what are the methods that will be used? A lot of times uh, we tend to have this sort of uh, taken for granted approach to how we will carry out research and how will, the, how will, the, will those be and what about the analysis and the final packaging or presentation of that work? And then thirdly is a willingness to be wrong and to be corrected 
and change course if you are part of it. And it's, it's uh, really something that uh, we, we, we see a lot where, because I have a very specific approach of a very specific target, even if I find the people that I'm collaborating with have a different idea, I still stick to it. And then it becomes a unidirectional uh, relationship where my ideas have to fly all the time and not those of uh, uh, the other people. And what voices, even, even in that relationship, what voices are being left out? Because even as we, we have our own local context, within those local contexts, there are certain things that are missed out. I remember when I was carrying out my own research uh, and I tried to uh, ask one of the artists that I was working on on, on on popular music to work with me in analyzing a text. And he said, no, if, if I help you and you publish, who gets proceeds from your book? It was very clear. And so that, that in itself, uh, of course, allowed me to see that even the people that we're trying to work with want more than just to be uh, helped or to be used to share some of the knowledge they have. And so I learned from that experience and uh, hopefully in my other subsequent work, uh, being able to uh, do much more co collaboration or relationship building uh, before I carry out work. And so for me, the relationships are good, but they have to be, the biggest part of it is cultivating what I would call, um, so in, in terms, terms of reference, how do we work with this? Why am I in this project? How is it reflecting my own priorities? And how will we use the final uh, project? Will it be available if it's a book? Will it be available locally for the people that I am representing and in the language that they can access it? And it becomes very important to have those questions up front and then working towards a place where you feel like you're both co-creating the project, co-creating the conference, co-creating the book, co-creating the research, and learning from each other. But the final question I ask is, do the structures within which we work allow for that true partnership, relationship, collaboration? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moenda. Uh, I will now give the word to Francine Saya uh, from Quebec. Thank you. Thank you to invite me for, to that uh, interesting roundtable. Uh, I will start from uh, some south uh, coming uh, from the Lausanne Manifesto and also linked to the initiative of Anthropen, uh, a French uh, speaking dictionary online about anthropology. I have an interest in the recognition of anthropologists and anthropologies in the countries where we go. When we wrote the Lausanne Manifesto, one of our perspectives was this, the idea of calling for a non-hegemonic anthropology, which is not only an anthropology that contributes to a decentered vision of societies and cultures from a body of knowledge developed in countries that have contributed through religion, economy, language, or science to coloniality, but to touch the art of the discipline itself, that of a knowledge that draws on a universal, certainly, but reinvented universal created from a movement of co-knowledge of multi-directional exchanges of knowledge. Knowledge that is not necessary ethno-knowledge, but scientific knowledge coming from various places of production of knowledge. It seems to me that the Wiener Green Declaration goes in this direction and participates in this movement. 
I think that several pages of the manifesto could be written, rewritten and republished from such a declaration. Welcome to those interested. In order for such a thing to happen, the principle recognized by Werner Green, I have some remarks. It is necessary that this begin with a work of recognition of an anthropologies of the world within the formation in the various countries where academic teachings of anthropology are provided. If our training is Euro-American centered, it will not achieve the desired result. The countries that are traditionally the places of exotic fields will not find their account because the students and researchers will not be sufficiently prepared. This must also be done in the countries that receive anthropologies, uh, that receive anthropologies, sorry, uh, anthropologists from the hegemonic countries to recognize their own knowledge, people, corpus, institutions, and that they resist the only Euro-American centered norms, as if anthropology were a matter of unique health. The example of the growing prominence of theoretical perspective emanating from Afro-Brazilian circle in Brazil, or of theories emanating from various minority groups and currents in Canada, shows that, that a paradigmatic shift is underway and necessary. At the same time, everywhere, this also means an internal decentering of bodies of knowledge to take an interest at home in bodies of knowledge that distance themselves from the anthropological norms that reproduce national logics. If feminism has been able to do this, queer theories, migration studies and others are pursuing this path. We are talking here about a decentering of the self in relation to the self everywhere and of the self in relation to other everywhere. The formation can also be Euro-Americano-centred in the South. Sorry for the, ter the terminology South. The models of true anthropology coming to us from certain countries that have been driving forces in the construction of international bodies of knowledge. These bodies of knowledge and their bearers are attractive. This can ensure that the realities of countries outside Europe and North America can be read by so-called academic local anthropologists, mainly from these bodies. There is little or no local science in that sense. We must therefore ask ourselves the question, what are our corpuses made of? With what theories and from which corpus do these theories draw? The complexity of this recognition, auto-recognition and inter-recognition is great. Without recognition, there is no possibility to actualize the principles recognized by Werner Green and ABBA now. This will remain an utopia. That's why I had my bird behind <laughs> to <laughs> recall us. We are talking, everybody of us, about utopia and it is important to talk and dress the table. Local theories are no data data from informants, but bodies of ideas to be discussed. Yes, but they are no local, not, they are not local true. We must avoid their naturalization and essentialization. That's what, when I read the Werner Green declaration, I was uh, attracted by the problem, the possibility of naturalization and essentialization. Local theories can reproduce the ideas of Eurocentric bodies of work, for example. Canadian anthropology, which is predominant, predominantly sorry, Anglo and American centric, 
on their visits, Canadian Francophone anthropology, and therefore has little interest in the theories that emerge from it. This is also true of the national hegemonies in which anthropology sometimes participates. The courageous account of Darcy Ribeiro was not always the leading theory of anthropology at the time of the Cotas War in Brazil in 2000-2010. The importation of French cell republicanism into Brazil attracted many anthropologists. Another point is important. Local academic theories are too often devaluated according to the language of publication of the vehicle or the vehicle. But by publishing local academic knowledge in national languages, its circulation is weaker. Problem of visibility. By publishing in the language of the hegemony, English, we contribute to another form of invisibility, that of the spirit of the language or the letter of, and the links between local categories, local theories, languages and sciences. It is an effort to address this problem that Anthropen, the French language dictionary of anthropology anchored in the contemporary and online has begun its publication it's in French. We will try to see how to valorize local theory, local language in the dictionary by our next multilingual laboratory. The example of the category living together, translated by viver juntos, by living together, and then by buen vivir, its study would indicate to us many of the linguistic and conceptual distortions that we observe when linguistic transfers are limited to translation alone. And I will finish with that. The question of the places of publication is also important. It is the publications in ranked journal that count for researchers everywhere. A publication in American anthropologists counts more than one in Anthropologica, uh, et uh, Ethnologie Française, MANA. With this story, we are going in circles since we are contributed to a kind of linguistic injustice to academic local knowledge. We create in the very places of knowledge production the hegemony that we would like to see disappear in a favor of a renewed universalism and an extended recognition of anthropological knowledge. We contribute to cognitive, cognitive injustice and to the capitalism of knowledge predation. This situation must stop and I believe that this view is shared by a large majority of colleagues, but not by some large publishers by, and by our university managers. It seems that the multiplication of multilingual journals try to respond to this problem. I am not sure this will change the ranking. That's for today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Francine. So now we will have Carmen Real from Brazil. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Clara. And also thanks, uh, Isaac Niamongo, the new chair of WCAA for the invitation. It made sense to debate this topic in WCAA when the World Council of Anthropological Association was established and Muggsy and Gordon should remember very well. It's crucial aim was and always has been a fight against inequalities and domination in anthropology, a fight against existing hierarchies, against the division into center and peripheries. With this, this is also the project of other institutions. Francine Sayan just presented uh, Anthropen, um, Danielin, who is going to talk after me, he's going probably to present the new grant of the Wenner grant that goes in the same direction. Of course, to look inside our disciplinary field is not all that WCA does. It's very concerned what's going on on the world, the places where we practice our discipline. 
And the world has gone through difficult times. So we just have to look at the statements issued by WCAA and WOW in the past few years to get an idea of how turbulent time has been with the rise of patriotic nationalism and the election of the extreme right wing presidents. Fortunately, there were protests, protests for racial justice, especially in US, George Floyd, gender equality, especially in Latin America, ni una menos, and social inclusion. This protest shows that crisis, usually a word used in a negative sense, can be seen as an opportunity for change. And change we also had to do in, within our own discipline. The precarious employment for anthropologists has been approached mostly by EASA and now also by WCAA. Now we have a, a new task force on precarity. And we also discussed for some time the threats concerning the dismantling of anthropology departments in countries like France, Belgium, England. We denounced the lack of national financial research for anthropological research in many countries. However, the North-South relations in anthropology, the relations between anthropologies has been less problematized. The motion signed by Gustavo and I that Clara presented in the beginning points out the unequal academic exchange within the global academic system a persistence in balancing in our scholarly community. I see that many participants of the webinar arrived uh, later, so I will remember the central points in this motion. The test proposed changes to establish international exchanges among anthropologists that are more horizontal. To avoid what in Latin America we, we common call intellectual extractivism, is important that foreign researchers consider local academics as partner, partners and not as informants. And for that, we propose two actions presented by Clara, one of them was presented by her, that the research projects to be conducted abroad clearly demonstrates knowledge of work produced by local academics by seeking literature in the local language not as data, but also as theory. I agree with what Karim, Karim just said. M more than once I came across projects by researchers who came to Brazil for field work in places already researched and did not bother to read what had been produced by local colleagues. Or if they read it, do not sit them conveniently as they are unknown works abroad. The second point in the, in the text uh, said that the projects should show involvement of foreign researchers with the local academic community where research is conducted by means of their present presence in graduate courses in the country in question. Participation in seminars will be positive and denote a more horizontal exchange with mutual benefits. I heard from John Collins, a CUNY researcher who did field work in Bahia, that out of self-interest, he attended the seminar of a Brazilian professor, Ordep Serra, on North American interpretative anthropologist. And that, he said, he learned more than in all his previous training. Uh, it's kindness, uh, it's a kindness of her to say that, but uh, he said he, he could understand not only his Anglo-Saxon position, but, but also his position in relation to intellectual production. Um, must be something true about this statement. 
In another direction, in this test, we also propose that anthropological journals pluralize the composition of the editorial boards. By doing so, they would be able to recognize that there is different ways of writing anthropology, which is an important uh, barrier as that of language itself. It would favor the publication of articles by anthropologists from a variety of countries. Language is important. Uh, Karim talked about it, but it's not all. Uh, it's not enough to translate. It's very important to consider the style of writing that it's it changed a lot from country to country. Despite threats from outside, it's important that we do not lose sight of critical situation within our discipline. Relations are good when they are mutual, equal, Moenda said. Inequality has to be addressed and we have to act to, to, to change them. It's time for an anti-colonial turn to change North-South relations. In short, it's time for a post-colonialist perspective that aims to break the epistemology of knowledge created and reproduced over the centuries. Utopia, maybe, but let's believe in the bird behind Francine. Thank you, Clara. Thank you very much, Carmen. So last but not least, in the first round, we will go to a second round afterwards. Uh, we will have Daniline uh, Rutherford from the Wanna Grant Foundation. Welcome, and thank you for participating. Well, thank you so much. And I'd just like to note that I'm joining you from the traditional lands of the Lenape people, past and present, here on Manhattan. Um, it's terrible to go last in this um, presentation because I would rather just hear everyone discuss all these remarkable points that have been raised. And um, I could spend my four minutes just scratching the surface of some of the thoughts that all of you have inspired in me. So I just want to thank you all so much. And I want to thank, you know, everyone who organized this panel and also the ABA for putting together this very important initiative. I want to say a few words about why we were quick to support the statement and then talk a little bit to address Francine's utopian issue around some of the concrete things that we're doing. Um, and then turn it back over uh, to you. Um, uh, and I'm gonna share my screen because I have some data and some pictures that I'd like to show. Um, I wanna say a little bit about Wenergren as an organization because I think that history is important and saying why I really welcome this. Wenergren Foundation was founded by this man, Axel Wenergren, who was a Swedish uh, industrialist, um, one of the most wealthy men in the world, uh, you know, made vacuum cleaners and refrigerators, had a large yacht, sold a yacht, needed to put the money someplace where he wouldn't need to spend, you know, pay taxes, created what he called the Viking Fund, um, was convinced by this man on the far right, who was a Hungarian avant-garde filmmaker and amateur ethnographic filmmaker, to devote the foundation to anthropology. The two men met over cocktails, and then they went off to brew on an amateur archaeology expedition, after which Feos came back to the United States, where the foundation was incorporated, and talked to American anthropologists and tried to figure out what the discipline was. So it's basically a grand historical accident that went Grand exists and its internationalism historically has a particular flavor. It's two Europeans founding a foundation that found its center of gravity within American anthropology. And you know, that is sort of um, a history that we're grappling with now in trying to walk the walk on our motto, which is supporting anthropology worldwide. Uh, we went through a strategic planning process a couple of years ago and developed a mission statement and a set of priorities. The priorities include advancing knowledge, addressing precarity, amplifying the impact of the field, but most importantly, and what I see as key to achieving all of our goals is fostering inclusion, uh, promoting an inclusive conversation that draws on the full wealth of knowledge that anthropologists and their interlocutors worldwide have to bring to this field. So this is something that's very important to me, and I know it's important to everyone who works with us. Um, and yet we've kind of failed. And I wanna show you some statistics. And these are you know, statistics that we amassed as part of the strategic planning process. We fund more grantees from US institutions. This is the top, you'll see the dissertation fieldwork grant and the bottom is the post PhD research grant. 
And we fund many more grantees from Global North institutions. And here I'm looking at where people are based, not citizenship. So it's looking at what programs in what countries are hegemonic within the discipline. Dissertation fieldwork grant, it's really a stark contrast. There are hardly ever any dissertation students who we fund who are based in institutions in the Global South. Post PhD, it's not quite extreme, but still pretty extreme. And then this is perhaps in some ways a very interesting statistic as well. We fund more students from institutions where we've awarded more than one award. So that means that if you are a student in a program where you know, there are 20 of you and five of you are applying for Wintergreen grants and two of you get it, you're much more likely to be someone who gets one of our awards. And if you're, you know, applying from a place where we're only going to be able to award one person, that's basically reflects, you know, um, privileged programs, which have a long history of grant writing for us. They have many models to draw upon. They're much more likely to win our awards. So anyway, it's very clear in our funding that we reproduce these hegemonies. And most recently, I looked at, you know, 2019 to kind of think about our impact across all of our programs, you know, and still the impact is felt most heavily in the global north. So this is a problem for us. Um, and, you know, again, before the ABA resolution, it was also something I began thinking about pretty much from the moment I stepped into this role. You know, and we've tried to do things to sort of um, expand the conversation by supporting a more inclusive pool of app grantees within these large grant programs, the so dissertation fieldwork and post PhD research grant. You know, trying to change the review process by changing the reviewers. You know, we have a two stage process you know, in which one reviewer reviews all of the applications we get, you know, um, at stage one, and then the ones that they pass forward go to stage two, where there's a panel review with three reviewers. Um, we have, you know, set numbers of reviewers that we recruit every year. We try to cover a range of different topical areas. Um, uh, and we assign them all the same number of applications. We get around 1500 applications a year. We're only able to fund about 15%. So they have to do the hard work of making heartbreaking choices around which ones we're gonna be able to fund and which ones we're not. You know, so one of the changes that we've implemented is really trying to expand, you know, the set of people who are reviewing for us. So at this point in the stage two panel review, 22 out of our 54 reviewers are based in the global south. That's about 40% overall. We're not doing quite as well with our screeners, um, seven of 40, that's about 17% overall. I think we could do a lot better on that. Um, at the same time, we're making a concerted effort to include more reviewers from underrepresented groups within North America. Um, BIPOC anthropologists working in a range of different fields. Um, so all of this is something that we're working on. You know, are we seeing uh, effects very quickly? Not necessarily. Um, part of this has to do, and again, I've had marvelous conversations with many of the people who are in this webinar around some of the structural problems with our grant making. You know, the dissertation fieldwork grant is very much modeled on a global north view of the discipline where you study theory at home in the global north, you go off to the global south and collect data and you come back and process it back at, at home which is a very different understanding of anthropological training than in many parts of the world so all of these things are things that we've been thinking about you know but one of the things that the ada resolution really brought home to me and i think that this was beginning to come out as we began to get a more diverse set of reviewers is that we can also use our funds and prestige to change the way scholars in the global north approach their work and I think this has been a source of enormous irritation for applicants who come to us from the global south, where they're told you're not sort of putting together your project in the right way because you're not speaking to the theory in English that's circulating within my own local you know, community of anthropology, hence you're not being theoretical, you know, that is actually something that's incredibly problematic in reproducing these hegemonies. And now we have reviewers that are calling to task applicants who come from the global now north and work in places where there's a rich tradition of anthropological thinking, you know, and telling them, no, we're not going to fund your project if you cannot actually engage with scholarship there. Um, uh, you know, and I think that along with this also is coming again, some of the comments 
of my fellow panelists really sort of came home, it's sort of like there are also, you know, margins within the center that, you know, there are movements afoot in North America. Um, Kristen Smith's initiative, Cite Black Women, you know, that having a more diverse set of reviewers is really pushing applicants to just think more broadly about under-recognized sources of knowledge within our field. Um, at the same time, and again, Carmen was referring to this, the effect of COVID-19, the worldwide movement for Black lives, you know, bringing forward the fact that this is really a transformational moment for the discipline. Um, it's impacting the way we're encouraging reviewers to evaluate research, you know, remote um, for Global North scholars doing research in the Global South. It means collaboration, and in this moment, collaboration, if it's not ethical, it really should not be funded. And this is something that we're thinking about really carefully that, you know, the field is going to have to develop ways of people working together, you know, in an equal fashion if we're really going to move forward knowledge in the field, you know, and I really appreciated the comments around the importance of relationship building. You know, that seems like that's actually really something key, you know, that's coming forward, you know, at the same time as working with local collaborators, fellow anthropologists, also research participants as co-producers of knowledge, you know, some of the remote uh, methods that Global North scholars have been experimenting with really put research participants in a much more active position of knowledge production, you know, doing a lot more of the work of reflecting, of listening in on conversations, of offering their thoughts about what's going on in this context, how to address the research problem that's been set up. You know, um, this needs to be acknowledged. It needs to be honored in the budgets that our applicants put forward. Um, it also needs to be acknowledged in terms of the co-production of knowledge. And again, these whole questions of publication and how we communicate scholarly input you know, insights. All of these things, I think, really, you know, are ripe for a change. Um, uh, so, you know, um, in terms of Wenergren's position within this, you know, obviously, in many ways, all these visions are utopian, but I do feel like we do have, you know, some power perhaps to move university departments, perhaps to move journals, you know, perhaps to sort of like, uh, cultivate new ways of understanding excellence in the field. You know, there is prestige involved in getting our grants. And, you know, when we're kind of making these sorts of statements, when we're providing these models for how we need to think about research, you know, I like to think that actually does contribute some in sm some small way to, um, you know, promoting institutional change. Um, uh, but that's not the only thing that we're really doing because I don't think it's enough. A moment ago, I talked about how the model of research on which our small research grants, the dissertation fieldwork grant and the post PhD research grant were founded was in fact quite a colonial model of research. And, you know, one of the things that we've been working on in recent years leading up to 2020, but, you know, in my mind has become even more important in the current moment you know, are some of these new initiatives. I mean, we're doing some things to try to level the playing field for people who do apply for a dissertation fieldwork grant or post PhD research grant. Um, you know, we've piloted the Wadsworth Institutional Grant in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, which is providing pilot funding and grant writing training to graduate students within that department. Um, we're also uh, creating a repository of successful grant proposals. So again, for people, you know, something that Carmen said, it's the genre of proposal writing as well as the language that you know, is something that really needs to be learned to be successful. Mentoring networks, we're moving to double blind reviewing. We're collecting, we're going to begin collecting much better demographic data, again, around people who are marginalized within their own home countries. We know nothing about our success at supporting, you know, people from these groups. So this is something that we're going to be looking at more closely. But perhaps most importantly is that we're launching a major new research grant program. Um, the Engage Research Grants first deadline will be August 1st and to support research partnerships that empower those who historically been among those research in anthropology rather than researchers themselves. And this will be, you know, I think quite a difficult grant to get unless the applicants already have strong relationships, strong and egalitarian relationships with the communities, you know, in who, on whose behalf and with whom they're going to be working. So. These are for projects that are collaboratively planned from the get go, from the beginning to the end, from the formulation of the research questions to plans for how the results are going to be disseminated. You know, and I think, you know, this may really make a difference in terms of the balance of research we're supporting. 
because if you think about this whole, again, the colonial model of learning, you know, theory in Europe and going off to the rest of the colonized world, you know, again, that's not a recipe for strong relationship building. That's not a recipe for egalitarian relationship building. You know, it seems like places where there is a strong tradition of activist anthropology, of anthropology on behalf of communities, people who come out of those traditions, I think are going to have a much better chance of getting these awards. So these are some of the things we're doing. You know, I also have things to say about the challenges we're facing, but I don't wanna go on and on at this point. I'd rather um, maybe turn it back over to my colleagues and, you know, sort of engaging in the conversation. I mean, all of these things, language, you know, the challenges are enormous, but um, again, I'd really like to hear from the rest of you. So, you know, thank you for giving me an opportunity um, to participate and to learn from the things that all of you have had to say. Yeah. Thank you very much, Denlin. So we finished the first round. We'll go now into the second round. And now we already have some food for thought because everybody gave their inputs. Now in the second round, I really ask everyone to keep, you know, keep the, the timing uh, up to three, four minutes tops so that in the end we can have some time for, um, for debating, for discussion, uh, addressing some of the points that have been raised on the chat. As you can see the chat, a lot of people are writing and asking and commenting, etc. And I was just thinking uh, of, of what uh, uh, Dan Lin was just mentioning now, the, the grant for, people who have been historically researched and have not been researched. And I, I really think it's going to be difficult, not just to get the grants, but to figure out who, where you're going to draw the line. Because I, I'm just thinking of my case. I mean, Portugal is nowadays considered Western Europe. But for, as you know, for decades, uh, in the 50s and the 60s, Portugal and Spain, for instance, as South America, I'm not even thinking of Africa or Asia, of course, but uh, of course those are obvious, but even us, we were researched by American anthropologists. We were the south of the traditional typical uh, peasants, right? Like wolf uh, theories, etc. So where do you draw the line? Where does the historical line stop to say, okay, these people were researched up to here and now they are researchers. It's very difficult. So having all the topics that you all have addressed in mind. We will now go to the second round and please keep it short. So as I said, we, we have time in the end for more um, general discussion. So we'll go back to Karim again, please. I, I just want to really uh, thank Carmen for her point about the importance of style. And that it's not just a question of language, but a question of style. I think that's a really essential point. And I was actually thinking about it afterwards when people started talking, I was like, oh, why didn't I talk about style? So I was really glad that Carmen raised that. Um, you know, I see that, and I think it gets to my second point about the marginalization of indigenous uh, scholars within, even within the global South, within anthropology, because in my experience, a lot of the indigenous graduate students I work with, even some of my colleagues tend to operate in a very different stylistic way than people at the top research institutes like Academia Sinica in Taiwan. Uh, it's, it's a stylistic form that's often very much talking to a different audience and much more interventionist and in a ways that's, that often result in that kind of work not being treated a, a, the same way, at the same kind of respect within sort of academic circles. So I think that that one really has to be very sensitive and, and think about that style. And perhaps style needs to be translated as well as language. Uh, you know, and that's something I do, uh, you know, when I try and work with my students to say, co-author an article to try to, uh, to try and help translate their work into a global anthropology language. And that's something I feel that, you know, those of us who are working these kind of bridge positions can do. So that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you very much. So now Muenda, you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I want to talk about, there was a, there was a question for all of us that was addressing the fact that uh, we have centers within centers or centers within peripheries where uh, there are existing Northern or Southern uh, areas of power imbalances 
and how do we problematize that? And, and indeed it is. Uh, the, the example that I gave uh, of one of the uh, people that I was working with who didn't want to collaborate with me, of course, had, had, had realized that I have access to certain resources that he did not and wanted to see how that is being shared. So indeed, even within the North, even within the so-called South, uh, so-called North, there are within them certain different ways that we need to also be very, very particular about how relationships are formed. Uh, sometimes it also depends on the universities, if uh, we're talking about uh, universities uh, and sort of the, the, the brand identity they have. So that even scholars from those specific universities may have more clout within the same country than their colleagues in uh, institutions within the same country. And so these challenges of how do we navigate relationships uh, on an equal partnership do uh, attend even in places where uh, it's within the same, uh, the same locale. But let me say this, that uh, for me, I think for anthropologists who have for the longest time been able to amplify the voices of sort of the so-called marginalized, they should be able to use that approach to really create really good um, core authorship, core editorship, core uh, curation of materials that will advance our, our discipline. Because when we have access to people, when we have trust to peop uh, in, in people, when people share with us their lives, their, their, their ideas, how do we amplify those and not just own them and make them our own in order to advance our own careers? How do, how do they influence their own positions? Uh, in their own country. So I think we have, we have the tools. We just need to restructure. And I, I think I really liked what uh, uh, Renegren is doing because of asking how is it as a very key entity within the anthropological training uh, machinery, how is it going to change the ways in which we look at training? And I, I myself uh, uh, always want to say that uh, I am, I am a good uh, recipient of the support of Venagran. And I didn't know about it until uh, much later because I didn't have access to that information. So how can it use the networks to popularize the work that it does and ask so the scholars from the North to first acquaint themselves with what's going on with the places they want to go before they even apply and theorize about the places they want to go. I think that's that's a good a good place to be, and I and, and I think as anthropologists, we have a task to use our knowledge, our networks, to build a better discipline and work with our colleagues in other disciplines as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moenda. So now Francine again, please. Thank you. Uh, I will just uh, ask to everybody, uh, address to everybody the, this idea. Uh, why not thinking about a sort of international laboratory to do what we are thinking about? I am believing a lot in little and big projects together. I mean, a very, very uh, circumscribed initiative in the context of the internationality we are talking about. Uh, I'm thinking about a kind of laboratory like in, in which we can address issues of mutual interest chosen with teams who are really representative of the diversity within the discipline and through different countries of participation. Addressing that from the beginning in the curriculum we are using to produce knowledge. Uh, addressing also the production 
of knowledge on the field work. If people in hard sciences are okay to do that with moon and viruses, why not imagine ourselves outside of the anthropological aero model and within a sort of collaborative laboratory with, to experiment in a sort of uh, realist uh, uh, laboratory uh, with not huge teams, but teams who are engaged to do the thing and who are participating to that. Thinking, I'm coming back, we're in the formation, the circulation and the diffusion of knowledge. And to try that for different project, but not huge project, project where you can think of the different steps of production of material knowledge to include curricula in the diversity we want, to include people in the diversity we want to include the kind of circulation and mutual construction of knowledge the way we would like we are talking about here, to include also sort of, I will repeat the term in a very positive way, sort of utopian space of diffusion of knowledge. So I am just giving the idea of trying the kind of ideas we have above, you know, all the good South we, we, we are sharing to try that in a little scale and a large scale together. So little projects, experimental projects, and just try. Thank you, Francine. So Carmen, your turn now. Uh, just two brief comments. Uh, uh, first on style. Um, I don't want to blame my historical past uh, with Portugal, no, but uh, the Baroque style, it's very present in the anthropological <laughs> writing in Brazil. And uh, I think it's, it's important to consider that, but I'm not quite sure that we should translate style. Maybe what we should do is try to broader the capacity of reading different styles, no? Uh, anthrop anthropology diversity should be kept and the style is part of that. Uh, the test is our result. We don't work in laboratories. Uh, well, maybe the laboratory that Francine is proposing, but uh, I mean, uh, the, the science, the hard science laboratories, our product is the text. So it's not, it cannot be connect, disconnected from what we are saying of, from what we are. So style cannot be translated. Uh, and I, I mean, it might, might be, I, I, sometimes I try to do with my students because I, I know they are inside of a, a a community that uh, are going to give them notes and rates and grants. So they, they have to be able to talk with this community. Uh, but I, I try to keep as much as possible uh, the difference of uh, styles. And the other comment is about in, in the internal colonialism, uh, I think was uh, brought by Moenda. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, because this is something we should also address, and it's not uh, addressed here in this, in, in South especially, you know. Uh, it's very much internalized by our students, and not only students, by our graduation programs. Uh, if we read the, the, the reference in the, in the, uh, we call programs, but uh, you have ah, oh, you have a very interesting work. Is uh, Cybulus Sibilus Sibilus? You mean syllabus? Syllabus, yes. <laughs> if you read this, uh, uh, even in topics in fields that we are pioneers, like urban anthropology with Gilberto Freire, 
Gilberto Velho, Gilberto Freire, or uh, Ethnicity, with Arcy Ribeiro, with Roberto Cardoso de Oliveira, they tend to, 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 to put in, on the spot the, the theories of the North. Uh, and and this, that happens to our students too. So uh, internal colonialism is something that we also have to address. Okay, thank you, Carmen. Thank you very much. Now we have Daniel again, who's actually been the major target of the talk in the chat. So, <laughs> yes. Well, you are better better saying Wenegren has all sorts of provocations, Mugsy. Yes, yes, yes. No, these are great provocations. <laughs> yeah, what is the global? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to address the whole question. Word and tell them how all the so let's say how let's see how Danlin answers to all these provocations. They're <laughs> well intended, I'm sure, but uh, yes, very great. Okay, Clara, if I if I miss any, please let me know. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the global north, global south. I really appreciated Karim's um, discussion of that. You know, when I came in, that wasn't a dimension we were looking at. We were looking at English the English versus non-English speaking world, but there were weirdnesses around that where if you were from Germany, you were in the English speaking world, you know, and I just actually really did want to get a sense, a rough sense about how global geopolitics, you know, kind of fit into this. But obviously it's a deeply fraught category. I mean, I think one of the other things that I've been in discussion um, around is the possibility of a project that would look at anthropological futures in different sorts of um, anthropological traditions and looking at what role the history of anthropology in different places plays in the ways that futures are being imagined. That's something I'm working on with Gustavo Lins Ribeira. I mean, I just think it's really important to be very specific about what you're talking about. You know, it also comes out of, you know, the question that Muggsy had, which I always enjoy these kinds of provocations, how about just not funding any global North applicants for one season or one year? I mean, I think that would be a really interesting experiment. Before turning to that though, I'd like to know more about who are we actually funding when we're funding applicants based at um, institutions in the global North. There's a whole problem of the marginalized voices within anthropology in the global North itself. Um, we do look at citizenship and, um, uh, the rates of success of applicants who are global South citizens in global North institutions is sometimes higher than US citizens or global North citizens at those same institutions. So I think getting a finer sense of like who within the global North are we supporting, you know, that's kind of, I think, an interesting move to take. Um, you know, the sort of critique of anthropology and its colonialist and racist roots you know, it's coming very strongly out of, you know, colleagues involved in associations like the WCAA. It's coming out very strongly from, you know, anthropologists who are based in institutions and traditions in the global south. It's also coming out very strongly from BIPOC anthropologists who are based in the global north. Another one of the collaborations we're doing is around a webinar series on radical humanism which is articulating many of the same kind of aspirations as we've been talking about here. How do you create a collaborative, anti-colonial, decolonizing form of anthropology? But it's coming, you know, the center of gravity of that discussion has been, you know, again, BIPOC scholars based in the global north. So I think there's a whole wealth of thinking about how to remake anthropology that really cuts across these divisions. And again, for me, in terms of, you know, why do I do the statistics that way? Well, you don't do statistics to direct you to answers. You do statistics to tell you what you probably already know, which is you have a problem. Again, it's a rhetorical force you know, it helps to justify doing things differently, investing money differently, and so on. So anyway, I really appreciate those, those comments. Um, I also wanted to say something about class, which has also come up here. Uh, one of the things we're going to be doing in terms of collecting demographic information is collecting information on parents' level of education. Now that's not a perfect indicator of class by any stretch of the imagination, but it is something that we want to begin to look at. Um, 
in you know um, many places it takes a very long time to get a PhD in anthropology and it's taking an enormous risk with your future. Who can afford to do that in these times? That's a question we really need to ask ourselves. Um, but the other thing alongside that, you know, um, I love Francine's idea of the laboratory. You know, again, being experimental, figuring out what kinds of models can work for collaboration. That's a great idea. I think in going into that, it would be important to keep in mind some of the lessons that have come out of important work that's been done at EASA around precarity and anthropology. You know, that for us from the US where anthropology and my you know, own background is very individualistic kind of pursuit, you know, I always think, oh, Europe, this is the land where people do collaborative projects, isn't this wonderful? But those can harbor new forms of hegemony, new forms of exploitation. So, you know, alongside thinking about relations between people who are positioned differently in the periphery or in the centers, we also need to think about generational issues and issues of precarity and security within the field. You know, one of the other new programs that we've um, uh, um, launched in recent years is the seminars, um, uh, Wenergren seminars, which are hosted events that bring together anthropologists of different generations, you know, and I would really welcome anyone who wants to look into that program, you know, that would be a really interesting place to sort of perhaps host this kind of experimental conversation or collaboration, really think about, you know, what kinds of um, protocols for ethical collaboration might we want to try to think through together. And again, you know, I would encourage everyone to think about all forms of marginalization, not just global north, global south, but also think about, you know, forms of marginalization connected to where you are in your career. Um, so that's another thing I just wanted to say in response to this. Um, uh, yeah, and um, yeah, in terms of internal colonialism, absolutely, it's a huge issue. I mean, in my own work, I've worked in West Papua, which is, you know, marginalized, internally colonized part of Indonesia, and the tradition of anthropological research on West Papua coming out of Indonesia reflects very much a colonial legacy and, you know, um, lots of the same problems as you see, you know, in more hegemonic forms of anthropology today. So, you know, this is something that I think we, you know, always need to keep in mind. Um, so, yeah. Um, are there other things that I got thrown at me, Clara, that I didn't answer? Um, yeah. Well, Benelin, you know, there's there's just so much written on the chat. I just think it's it's been, you know, so fruitful, all the comments and, and discussion, of course, it addresses multiple issues. And I mean, we all know that we are in a sort of epistemological turning point in anthropology, perhaps following what started in anthropology with reflexive anthropology in the 80s, I don't know. But but the fact is that the, the, the fact that we are here today discussing these issues, uh, to me, it has to do with the whole rest of the environment, the you know environment in a large um, sense of the word. Uh, I mean, you know, at a time when we are now throwing statues down, uh, thinking about restitution of objects. I think all the things are connected because just think, you know, 20 years ago or even 15 years ago or 10 years ago, probably ABBA would not have written this motion. Probably Wenagren would not have signed it. And of course the issue, for instance, of the hegemony of English, which is something we've been discussing a lot. And, in dub and I think WCA has done a lot towards uh, sort of uh, changing that pattern of English hegemony. We have the Jalou, we, uh, we, we are planning on webinars in different languages, but it's still very complicated. So for me, um, one of the things that has been touched upon here today, which is the issue of publishing in English or other mm -hmm. languages and the connection with editors and publishers is very, very important. Um, to, to change things. And I think we're just starting to do it. But I, I you know, I, I think um, Muggsy, of course, was radical. But yes, it's it, we are in a starting point of these things. And I think that's very good mm -hmm. uh, that we're finally moving things forward. We're not just talking about it and nothing happens. No, we are writing, uh, you 
you know, things like the ABBA motion and, and perhaps, yes, perhaps in a few years on editors and publishing and language, etc. So let's go back now that everybody has had a second round. We will have, um, we've been here almost one and a half hour, but let's have 15 more minutes for a general discussion. Whoever wants to talk, please either. I think the best thing is that you raise your hand so I can give you the floor, me and Michelle, who's the host, because of course in the chat, there has been a lot of things and a lot of things that have also been uh, already discussed by our participants. So Jonathan uh, is raising his hand. Can you please give him the floor, Michelle? Okay, thank you. Hello, thank you. Am I aud audible? Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for raising the issue and for debating it. Uh, I would like to defend a more of a Marxian position here, because I do uh, think um, that- Jonathan, please let us know where you come from, please. Where I come from, spiritually or li from literature, or I don't identify okay. with national identities. If this is what you're asking, I grew up mostly in the post-socialist world. If, if this is the question, and I'm working now in Germany, uh, but I'm not sure to what extent defines my privilege or not. <laughs> so my, I would like to provoke here because I think the response that focuses so strongly on identities is what many Marxian scholars have called a neoliberal response to the problem that doesn't necessarily undermine or, or, or risk any change in the actual status quo of, of things. Uh, uh, and I'm thinking of from such classical texts as Nancy Fraser's provocations to the more radical provocations of, of Adolf Reed, who uh, went as far as to call modern forms of anti-racism uh, um, uh, a neoliberal alternative to the left. Uh, um, so, and, and I think as anthropologists, we've written so much about what is privilege and how privilege is relative and, and contextual. And I think some elements of the debate I've heard today are kind of equating identities with amounts of privilege, which slips into a form of, of essentialism, <laughs> uh, uh, in other words, and, and, and assumes that only because someone is of a certain ethnicity or lives and resides in a certain country, this person will inevitably have less privilege than someone who might be white but lives in Detroit and maybe lost their home. Uh, um, uh, right, so so I think we, we need to be very careful with how we contextualize those things. And I think I, I think Danielin for mentioning class, but I don't think class should be just one of the elements upon all those intersections. I think class should be really prioritized as a, as a dominant form of exploitation uh, to which other oppressions of course play a role uh, and they need to be taken into account. Uh, uh, so I just wanted to say that that uh, it kind of we need to we need to think uh, in, more, in more complex ways and, and not risk essentializing identities through maybe uh, well motivated and noble kind of intent, uh, which ultimately slips into into essentialism. So uh, that's my provocation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to add something or or comment or react to Jonathan's provocation? Yeah, I really, I just want to appreciate that because again, you know, I'm part of a bureaucracy. It's not a huge one, but it is a bureaucratic structure. There's a way in which you look for what's countable, you know, and uh, there's sort of in, uh, essentialization is built into the very way that bureaucracies work. But I think at the same time, that's why it's so important that what the ABA resolution is doing, it's, it's pushing not just for changing who is doing anthropology, but changing the way it's done, changing the way it's presented. You know, I just wanted to take an opportunity and obviously class, it's just, these are all dimensions of privilege when you think about all of these different, you know, aspects. And so it's not just about making things more diverse for the sake of making things more diverse, but for addressing historical structures of privilege and oppression, you know, that are part of our world. So anyway, it would just be really fun to talk with you more about that. Obviously, we don't have time. I did want to kind of give a quick shout out to Lawrence Ralph, who's the editor of Current Anthropology, for the important work he's been doing in this regard, in addition to, you know, creating a much more kind of inclusive editorial board. He's also, alongside that, been thinking about different modalities of scholarly research, right, and scholarly expression, scholarly communication. So multimodality, 
photo essays, you know, again, getting at some of the things Karin was saying about, you know, language and genre, you know, again, alongside thinking differently about the research process and the forms of power that, you know, are instilled within it, also thinking differently about what it is to communicate. Um, work that we've been doing with Sapiens as well. We have a magazine for non-anthropologists and just kind of doing a whole lot of work to try to figure out ways in which scholarly communication can work, not just towards amassing kind of cultural capital within a narrow academic system, but actually communicating important ideas and making a difference in the world. So, yeah. All right, thank you, Danilin. We have Virginia raising hands. You know that you can raise your hand also um, in the in the in the Zoom uh, functions. Uh, ju just, I just wanted to add one thing from to what I said before, which was Carmen was in the chat, was writing about how the different national associations could also endorse the ABBA motion. I think everyone in the world uh, and all the associations will endorse it. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone will. But the thing is, it is important to have people like you, Daniel, in here because you do represent an important institution for, for anthropological research. So, so passing the word on to Virginia. Okay, uh, several things. Uh, Daniel, you're not the target. You are actually part of the solution. You're not the target. Okay, so the first thing. Uh, second thing is, uh, while I appreciate what Jonathan is saying, I actually think that several of the panelists have actually um, addressed it in some way. And uh, I don't think it's about identities, but I do think that the point about privilege matters. And there are patterns, which is why I think Danilin uh, showed these, uh, these uh, pie charts. Um, the fact of the matter is, okay, I live in the US, I teach at a major US uh, university. Um, the, 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 uh, the faculty in my department debated this thing. And in the end, I think did wonderful things, but it surprised me because actually I think most of the people in the US don't realize that they are doing any of these things. So uh, it may be, easy for associations around the world to agree to this, um, to the ABBA's motion, but I actually don't know that most anthropologists in the US or the UK or France, I'm being very specific, would actually agree to this. So I, I think uh, we need to also see patterns. Uh, among the patterns that nobody here has mentioned, at least directly, but that I think should be mentioned, is, is, is the fact that a huge number of people from lots of places in the world go to the US to get their doctorate, to get training. I, I, I think it's a training and not just a degree, but a huge number, okay? And that includes uh, you know, many people here and many people I know around the world. Uh, why? Well, maybe because they have had to learn English. Uh, so there's a whole language thing built into this as well. Anyway. Thank you so much, Virginia. This That is entirely true, but it's also true that for many, many years, uh, even for me being in Europe, most of the uh, grants for uh, you know masters for post graduation also came from the states. That was one of the reasons why you know Fulbright and all that why people also went to the states because it was considered a very good place to go to to study. So I will pass on the word to Mugsy who had his hand raised and I'm sorry if I I, I didn't realize if you had it before Virginia or after. So please, Mugsy. It was briefly to go back to that question which I had on the chat, which was. It's much, much less complex than I think than the one we have, this, the discussions we've been having. But how, how does one deal with take, recognizing all anthropologies when some might be supportive of oppressive regimes? And I think, and particularly in a world as we have today, where we have more and more oppressive regimes and they're going to turn to the academics around them and look for support. And what do we do with that? I mean, you know, I'm talking from a particular perspective, which is a South African one, where there was an anthropology which was supportive of, a, of apartheid, but it happened in, 
Hitler's Germany. It's uh, and what would what would have happened? What do we do with anthropology, which supports anything like that? Trumpian. I mean, we can list them of all. Not sure who should answer. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Yeah, I'm not sure there's an answer to that. Unfortunately, it is true what you're saying, but let's see who wants to react to some of what, you know, Muggsy said and, um, and what Virginia said. Gee, silence. We silence them, Muggsy. <laughs> <laughs> I on. think it's just so complex. It is, we could stay here for hours because it's endless. The topic is endless, right? But I don't know, did, did I see a, a hand Monk, raised? Wait, wait, Does wait. Do you want to say something? No. Wait a second. Monksy, Monksy also said something in the chat about uh, a radical idea that I would love to see mentioned. Well, I, I, I had- I that you were gonna lose your job. I said no. But, no, 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 but I had already, Virginia, I had already mentioned that. I, I didn't read the, uh, Muggsy's post on the chat, but I did say that, you know, Muggsy was radical in proposing that when a grant would only give uh, grants and sponsor projects coming from the <laughs> real files. And of course, that's what, what then Lynn was, you know, thinking that, yeah, mm -hmm. might, might be you know, complicated, but um, like Virginia said, Danilin is not the target. She's part of the solution. Yep. It's very good to have someone here discussing these issues with us uh, who is part of uh, a very important uh, institution for anthropological, for supporting anthropological research. So I think Malka wants to say something, please. If I may say two comments or two issues that are not of what has been discussed, but just to offer something. Uh, in the beginning, I, I mentioned on the chat the new initiative. And I want to say something after hearing all of you uh, in another way. Every year, the Israeli Anthropological Soci Association invite a keynote speaker, as you know the term, from the US mainly, and some, sometimes mm -hmm. from Europe. Virginia was one of them. So this is a tradition to look up to the American and European anthropology from Israel. Yeah. This year, we. Nina Mutsafi Haller, the president, decided differently. Let's make a change. No more keynote speaker. First, because there is corona and nobody will come to Israel in this time. <laughs> but then we took advantage of it. We say, let's turn to dialogues. Let's have dialogues with anthropologists in different places in the world that have their personal, professional, and commu communal experiences. So we had dialogues with anthropologists from Africa, from, I said, Brazil, from uh, 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 Bosnia or, or Serbia, sorry, Italy. And what happened, and we shared all the links, which I shared with you, with the in, inside the Israeli conference. And what we bring out of it is different issues that come up as the com common issues that on some of them you have mentioned here. For example, publication, uh, learning or not learning English as mandatory. Uh, 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 and so on and so on and so on. And we came to the conclusion that before we get big grants for our research and projects, now that we all became the Zoom, uh, uh, the human Zoom people, we have more uh, possibilities of having meetings, dialogues, sharing, bringing our students inside, but create a new culture among ourselves of open dialogues all over the world. By the way, my mission as the representative of the Israeli uh, society in this organization and the IOES uh, together is to call again and again and again and say that you are not wasting your time if you are coming to IOES conferences, you are not wasting your time if you invest in, uh, in collaboration with anthropologists outside of US, not only. And, and this is something that always need work inside. The second thing that I wanted to say, and uh, uh, I would like to ask Danilin to, uh, Danilin to follow uh, what I wrote her personally on chat, but I want to say something about the new grant that you just presented. I am very excited. Voluntarily, altogether, I'm working for almost a year 
with a team, wonderful team of researchers in Young University in North Ethiopia. We are meeting, we are discussing, and we are ending a proposal. But what is so special about it? They are only 13-year university. They never had a foreign visiting scholar. They don't even know how to talk about it. But they are wonderful researcher, interdisciplinary, few anthropologists that have no contact anywhere else, but just appointed to this organization through my connection with Isaac. But part of the researchers belong to very remote, small communities in the region. So these people are going to go back as researchers to their own community and have our dialogue. I don't know if we will be able to, to send our proposal to the, to the grant, but uh, we still have barriers, me as an Israeli speaking this English, them doing their best work in English. But what I want to say that this for me is a very new and empowering experience because they have such great perspectives, such great internal uh, cultural and cross-cultural skills. And, and we are creating something together. We are very brave. Right now we're doing everything voluntarily from all sides, but, but we believe that we have something to share with the whole world, with the entire academic world, social science uh, research world. And I will share it with you, of course, but uh, it's very, very empowering experience for me. Am I a privileged person? I am not in Israeli academia. I am an Israeli, it's English speaking in an African uh, grammar, with an African grammar. So we share some things together, even though our locations seems to be in the old categories, but it's not. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to share this webinar, firstly, with all my colleagues in the Israeli Anthropological Association. I believe that this has an international importance, and this is a great contribution to discussions that are already taking place in different ways in different places. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malka. I think Malka raised a good point, with, which I've thought about often doing uh, organizing this webinar since April 2020, which is the fact that the only positive thing about COVID is that indeed it taught us that we can we don't need to all fly somewhere to meet, and we can all be here, each one of us in a different country, and discussing the things, which is really great. So, Francine, you raised your hand. Yes, thank you. I just want to reinforce uh, a, a portion of what Micah said. Uh, and I just to uh, share in 2007, uh, before the Lausanne Manifesto and uh, Anthropen, I organized a, a conference in the, for Francophone anthropology. And I, we just asked the people uh, who were invited as keynote to do dialogue systematically. We had that for five or six times or, or more, maybe eight during all the all conferences. And the response of the public was just amazing. But the people we invited from Africa, from South America, from different places in the world to have that north-south uh, discussion and dialogue. The people coming at the time from, from Europe were so <laughs> stressed about the idea of working that way. It was very interesting. But people in, uh, in Quebec were absolutely crazy to do that and happy to do that kind of utopian space within the conference. And it was the beginning of the story of the Lausanne Manifesto and the story of Anthropen, that kind of experimental thing and that kind of why not doing, why not to do conference in that kind of breaking the tradition, breaking the kind of relations we are reproducing liking or not, you see. So I just want to say as far and as good that kind of practices are for us within the discipline and the memory of that conference is very, very 
great in uh, the history of anthropology in Canada. Thank you very much, Francine. And the relations key were are still going, you know, with all those people we bring together. Thank you very much, Francine. So um, we've been here almost two hours now. Uh, well, one hour, 45 minutes. Um, I don't know if we have, if anyone has anything else to say or to react to comments, etc. As I said, this webinar will be posted on the site. It will might take a few, few weeks because we are reorganizing the site, but it will definitely be available. Also with the chat so that everyone can go back to it. And hopefully we will indeed come back to these uh, issues and, uh, and further discuss and find hopefully some solutions for a lot of the problems that we rose here today. So does anyone else have um, want to say something or should we just um, uh, close here? And if we do, I really want to thank everyone again, all the speakers. Why don't, you, why don't you see if the panelists want to add anything? Yeah, that's what I that's what I just asked. If if the panelists but Wenda just put something in the chat. Um, Wenda, yeah, Wenda wrote something in the chat. He wrote letters, review specific relationships locally or institutionally, and start changing them today. Yeah, <laughs> that is indeed a good a good option or a good start. So if any, if no, none of the panelists want to add anything to what, what you've no, no, said. Uh, um, Claudia, I, yeah. I just um, using the, the formula that Virginia brought out, uh, I, I just uh, emphasize that uh, sometimes when we think about uh, North as a hegemonic place, we think about the United States and it's not always that. Uh, United States and the anthropologists the American are not the target. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, relations are mutual. Wanda said that. So, uh, and this yeah, motion when, when said that exactly. Yeah, was constructed with some American anthropologists. I, I quoted one of them, and uh, our experience, like uh, Gustavo, yes, he was trained in the United States, but I was trained in France, and I found there. Uh, realities that uh, made me think about this uh, necessity of change now so it's not only <laughs> it's, it's just that and then sometimes we get good uh, allies no They're like uh, the triple way uh, section on world anthropology is a step that's going to be uh, duplicated in other uh, journals like vibrant so let's not uh, simplify the relations. And it's uh, something that it's going to be a gain for uh, both parts, no? Exactly. I don't know, Otavio Velho once uh, uh, quote an American anthropology, well, this is an American, uh, who was uh, looking, who was in Copacabana looking at a mountain and say, well, this is a beautiful Atlantic forest. Right now there is people right, uh, walking in the streets and going to Africa, African Brazilian cults uh, to have their spirituality brushed, something like that. Uh, and Otago said, if these anthropologists had looked at the Brazilian literature, recent Brazilian literature, he, he would know that the forest is not Atlantic anymore. There was a, a deforestation. People do not walk in the street at night because of the militias armed. <laughs> and the African-American cults, they were taken over by neo-Pentecostalism. So this is a mutual uh, thing that it's very yeah. important. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we will uh, stop here. A lot of people have to go to other meetings. I have a meeting that 
I have to attend that started already half an hour ago, but we all, you know, this is the Zoom world we live in nowadays. We all have multiple tasks, but I truly want to thank all the panelists, all the participants, everyone who collaborated. And yes, the videos will be available. Ricardo and Michelle already gave you some advice on that on the chat, but, you know, just keep, uh, uh, just keep looking at, at our site and, and things will show up and you will be definitely, you will see through the communication uh, the WCA communication system that things will be available available, and you'll be able to watch this again and, and all the other webinars that we've had thus far as well. Thank you very much and have a very nice night, morning or day, depending on your time zone. Thanks a lot, everyone, once again. And the next webinar will probably be Thank in you. two months and it will probably be uh, Spanish. It'll be in Spanish.